Um, <coughs> yeah, what uh, my my little lecture uh, it is um, uh, it is a report of that what is going on uh, at Steidelville uh, at my publishing and printing house uh, and uh, for those uh, who are photographers they will understand what I'm talking about and uh, for the others it might be a little bit obscure uh, but uh, when uh, you look uh, to the books and the results of uh, the work then um, yeah forget about the technology and just be in your dreams. So uh, I'm since <coughs> since years I'm not giving up uh, to talk about the beauty of analog uh, because I don't think uh, we should uh, give our lives into the hands of digital uh, corporations <coughs> which just want to sell to us hardware and software and we should really be couraged and fight for our beautiful um, analog matters and um, I have uh, within the last uh, months I have written some texts uh, about uh, the beauty of analog and one is <coughs> the following one. My printing press is my dark room. When uh, one thinks of vintage prints, one tends to think of enlargers, chemical baths, contact sheets, photo paper, dodging and burning, perforated paper, long nights, trial and error, failure and beauty. In short, the entire magic of the analog. A vintage print is subjective. Parts of it, part of its essence is that it is divides from standard. In the photo lab, the artist toys with technical means in order to arrive at a print that fully meets the image he or she had in mind. Chance, chance is a welcome part of this process. My idea was to transpose the character of vintage prints onto book production. It goes without saying that books do not have the same status as handmade prints. But assuming you have command of a printing press, you can explore quite individual creative avenues to your heart's delight. Experiment and publish the result in large print runs. February 1990 saw the launch of Photoshop, a revolutionary image processing software. The Adobe developers took their cue for its applications almost entirely from the practical work in a dark room, which also means that someone who has a command of the craft of the photo lab can intuitively use Photoshop. The potential experiences gained in a dark room and with Photoshop can, in fact, be transported, transposed onto work with an industrial printing press. And the result are photo prints that are very much the equal of carefully processed vintage prints. In the printing industry, it is considered a mark of quality that a sheet can be printed in as high a run as you like, while the quality remains absolutely the same. Just as by printing from a negative, you can make a large number of identical images. The unique, surprising and possibly enigmatic side to vintage prints is something that printed matter does not possess. The latter lacks aura. However, if an artist works with me on press, as if we were in a dark room, we can definitely emulate the aesthetics of a vintage print. A printing press allows any number of manipulations to be made. In a photo lab, for example, the temperature of the developing bath 
influences the final image. With a modern printing press, you can adjust the temperature of the individual ink rollers. This makes it possible to change the viscosity of the ink. If you cool the rollers, the ink gets thicker. And conversely, when heated, the ink runs thinner. These altered inks are then absorbed by the paper, meaning I can manipulate color saturation levels. Moreover, <coughs> I can compose color combinations. Instead of relying on a single black, I can work with two or three different black tones. A black and white photograph, for example, can be printed in tritone using a black and two grays, or in quadrotone with three grays and a black, or two grays and two blacks, and so on. There is an infinite number of variations. There are an infinite number of papers too, just as the choice of photo paper interacts with the chemicals and exposure time to influence the print, the effect of an image or book can be fundamentally altered by the choice of paper. Uncoated paper, glossy or matte paper, yellowed, grayed, greenish, bluish, cold or warm tones, and what weight, what tactile quality, even the smell of the finished book depends on the choice of paper. As in a dark room, playing with the chemical and mechanical processes, a printing press offers the possibility of failure errors from which you can learn so much for future projects. One of my first clients, and at that time, I was 18 years old and had just started making edition prints for artists, was the German graphic artist and photographer Siegfried Neuenhausen. One of his pieces, which we wanted to produce by silk screening, showed a doll's torso. To reproduce the sense of depth of the plastic through printing, we spent half the night experimenting and ended up taking a transparent white, carefully tinted with a bit of magenta or cyan to get the optimal result. 18 colors added one after the other turned out to be the perfect recipe. At least that was the case until the next morning, as the now thoroughly dried ink layers refused to stick to the paper and crumbled off. Because I simply did not know that the transparent white did not have a binder component. That's how you acquire know-how. <laughs> Try again, fail again, fail better. Many years later, in 1999, together with Italian photographer Paolo Roversi, I printed his book Nudi for editions Stromboli at Steidl. Here, the Italian photographer presented nudes of famous models such as Kate Moss, Miller Jovovich and others. The idea was to print the book in the best quality technically conceivable at the time. We spent nights fine-tuning the printing press, printed one white over another until the subtle, tender and almost mystic feel was achieved that Roversi wanted. The book was indeed produced using a printing press. And of course we recorded exactly what we had done, but we were not yet able to store the settings digitally so there will never be a reprint that will even approximate what we achieved at the time. Nudi is an example of what I consider to be a vintage book, and not only because copies of it uh, are now changing hands for high prices. Steidel vintage books are artist books with industrial print runs. They draw on the artist's subjective decisions. Each book is an object in its own right, the results of a unique process. The artists are involved in every step of the production. It is a firm principle that 
anyone who wants to make a photo book with Steidel will have to travel to Göttingen several times. Firstly, in order to present his or her ideas and get to know us and how we work. Then, to sit down with the designers and decide the layout, to work with editors on the copy, to prepare the images for printing with the image processing team, and finally to work with myself and the printers on press. Only there, directly on site, can we experiment. Only there can I highlight and present what is technically possible. At times, this may result in dozens of test prints on different papers. And it sometimes also means we need to be daring to abandon ideas to which we have become attached. Together we explore how we can best realize the artist's vision. And if things go well, then we start playing with things, we break the rules, welcome chance, and, as in the dark room, experience the magic of the analog. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is what we have planned. It's really an opportunity, uh, an extraordinary opportunity, of course, that Gerhard is here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Mark Pachter and just the interviewer, really, on the occasion. But um, I want you to know that this is a double New Yorker occasion. There's the cover. And then um, this fellow behind me was the subject of a New Yorker profile in May of this year. So uh, it's extraordinary, you know, as, as New Yorkers as we all are, uh, that we have this, uh, this uh, double New Yorker honor tonight. Um, what we really have is the opportunity actually to talk with um, the technician, artist, magician uh, of the process and uh, one of his victims, co collaborators, uh, artist subjects. So uh, I, I don't think there's been this occasion very often. And we're going to make the heart of this discussion a little bit of uh, the history of their collaboration. But I'm going to start with a few um, biographical questions for Gerhard. Uh, just a few. You know, we'd, we'd all love to know a lot about him and definitely read the New Yorker article. But did you grow up in a home of beautiful books? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, my uh, father has not one book at home, but um, he was he was a cleaner at the local press company. So when the newspaper was printed in the night, he has to clean the press in the morning. Uh, but he helped me a lot. Uh, uh, to build up my empire, because uh, when I was started to be interested in printing, uh, he prepared for me paper and yes. ink pots, and I have stolen it from the company. <laughs> <laughs> so he has had a role. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not yeah. as a reader, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yes. Um, the next thing is, I'm going to put it rudely, just so you have the opportunity to correct me. Are you a failed photographer yourself? <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, when uh, when I was a boy, um, my my sister has a boyfriend, and uh, we had a my parents had a very small apartment, and we were all around. And to get rid of me, this boyfriend uh, bought a Kodak Retina camera, gave it to me with a film, and said, "Okay, go out in the afternoon and take some photos, so that he could be alone with my sister in the <laughs> tiny little apartment." So that was the beginning of my career as a photographer. And um, I actually I was very interested uh, in doing photography. Uh, I had no money at all because my, my parents were poor and to make some money I was uh, photographing at weddings and all this stuff and uh, made uh, prints in my dark room and sold it. And uh, I was getting better and better and uh, yeah, I, I had really some good commercial jobs and then, okay, <coughs> when I was 17, 18 I started to travel around looking at exhibitions. I saw a show of photos of Cartier Bresson and others and then uh, one day I thought I will never be as good as those guys and why dying once 
and jumping into the grave as a third-class photographer, so it is much better to work for the best photographers in the world as a technician F printer, and so I'm very happy with my position. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so are we. So the next uh, in the series of somewhat random and intrusive questions uh, is, uh, why don't you stay longer in New York? You're, he's, he's, uh, he's famous for coming in in the morning, and he will be flying out tonight, by the way. So why don't you stay longer? Are you so afraid of the city? No, I, I dream always when, when I'm traveling to stay a day longer and um, yeah, to meet more people and uh, to have some time for me uh, to look at shows and so on. But, you know, um, actually, um, uh, my job is to print, and uh, uh, I have to take care that the books which are tumbling out in Germany, out of our press, that they have the quality the people want to have. And that it's no excuse to travel and to uh, jump around the world uh, and uh, not taking care for the work. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, in the moment I'm sitting in a plane, I'm excited. When I arrive somewhere and start working, like today, this morning, it's okay. But in the evening, I'm homesick <laughs> and I have to go. By the way, if you do read the New Yorker profile, and I know now you will, if you haven't already, it's titled Book Monk. And now you know why. Now you know why. Uh, one New Yorker, among many, I'm sure, but one New Yorker had a bit of an influence on you as a printer, and that was Andy Warhol. And you can't actually spend an hour in New York without mentioning his name. Andy Warhol is so, so critical to the art life of this, of this uh, city. How did Andy Warhol affect your printing approach. Yeah, as I uh, told in my uh, lecture, um, I was starting as a screen printer doing serigraphies for artists, but um, you know, this uh, doing reproductions, that was not really my favorite. I wanted to go more into the creative side to do my, my uh, to release my photos as uh, posters and uh, announcements for exhibitions and, uh, and um, and others. And uh, one artist uh, I was really interested in was Andy Warhol because uh, in, in a very creative way, I saw this in his works, he was playing around uh, with uh, photography not very respectful. I like that a <laughs> lot. Yeah. So, yeah. so to, to make uh, doubles and upside down things and uh, to work with strong uh, inks on various materials um, and, and uh, that was something I could not find in Germany and I could not learn about it. And so um, uh, there was in my local newspaper was an exhibition of Andy Wall, of, of, of an exhibition of prints of Andy Wall announced in Cologne. Um, I was traveling over there. He was not very, very famous. It was uh, 1969 yeah? and um, it, um, there were not too many people and I asked him right away, uh, what is this technology and how do you do your screen prints and, and can you help me a little bit? I want to learn it. And uh, immediately he said, uh, the best is you come over to New York. Uh, I connect you with my uh, studio manager, Gerald, Gerald Melange, who is also the printer in my factory and he will educate it. And so that was one of my first trips to New York and the base of my empire. <laughs> the, the last um, maybe comment I'll make before we turn to Peter and then the interaction between you um, is I asked you before uh, the uh, program began whether uh, you had any favorites among your children <laughs> and uh, you refused to, uh, to say that you did. Are you such a uniform uh, good parent of all your productions? Yeah, uh, you have heard my uh, standing um uh, response to this uh, that like like a father who has uh, uh, eight children he cannot say i like children one two or three better than the five others uh -huh. uh, so you have to love them all and so it is with books it is not very fair to say okay uh, i like book a from artist b better than the other uh, but what i can say is um 
I love always best the last book I have done because all the experience from the previous one is uh, accumulating in this one and uh, then the best book follows always up because with new excitement you start a new work and okay I, I pretend to believe you yeah and okay then it is the one I love best okay um, now uh, we bring Peter into the uh, conversation let me give you a little bit of background uh, in Peter Badge as it would be pronounced in Germany or badge badges um, career as a Nobel stalker let's call him that uh, because it takes stalking to get the photos that wound up in this book. Um, I'm, the only reason I'm up here, that's got to be a little bit uh, on your mind, is because I, um, in a way, set Peter on his Nobel journey uh, at the Smithsonian uh, when he was, as you can see, he's clearly five years old now, but he was about two at that point. And um, we brought him into uh, as the photographer on a, an exhibition on Nobel laureates. Uh, he, what were you, 22, 23? 24. 24. 24. You were 24 at the time. Um, and so we've continued uh, our relationship. I, I look after him and make sure that he's still uh, pursuing laureates and nobody does it better and he actually does it quite officially now. And as a result of that, uh, a number of books have come up, but this is, this is going to be certainly the ultimate book because he has the ultimate printer to have produced it. And I'd like to know how this came to be, how this choice, first of all, how do you choose projects? Uh, because now I know every photographer in the world wants you <laughs> to print. So how do they get to be printed by Steidel? Yeah. No, it is uh, in, in, in the beginning it is always uh, very egoistic uh, because I want to learn something. And when I start working with an artist, I feel myself in the position of a student. And um, let's say the, the artist is uh, my professor and I'm the master student. And uh, so... Um, as I'm working for the professor as a printer, he or, he or she is of course interested uh, to educate me very well so that I can do a good job. And, um, and I can ask any stupid question. And uh, I remember once uh, when I was working, uh, start working in 1970 with Joseph Boyce, one day I asked him really from the morning to the evening something and he patiently gave to me answers. Uh, for example, I had no idea what is uh, the Goethe color circle in color theory and he explained it to me in detail and so on and so on. And in the evening I apologized and said uh, to him, sorry uh, Evan, forgive me that I ask you so many things and next time if it is too much then just uh, say it. And he said, no, no. Um, it's always good to, if, if you ask with, uh, there are never stupid questions and uh, uh, and don't forget with stupid questions every revolution begins and so uh, yeah that's uh, that's how I select select my artist and my books because I want to learn about it and once the book is ready and goes into the world I hope or we hope the artist and I hope uh, that uh, uh, the people who buy it and who are around the world will share our enthusiasm and our experience uh, do they these days now that you are so well known as as the master in this process uh, do they come to you with hat in hand asking you, do you uh, seek them out because you're interested in their particular work? <coughs> no, yeah. So the... <laughs> if... Um, there are photographers here, I'm sure, who would love to know. Yeah. If, if uh, I, I really don't want to work with somebody, then the waiting list is 25 years. <laughs> And, uh, you don't say no. You just don't say yeah. yes. I say twenty-five years. <laughs> and but you know it, it's it's tricky. By today uh, they program their iPhone, and in twenty-five years it rings. And <laughs> exactly that day they phone back. So it's not not really. So good. Peter, how did this come to be? Um, this this great work. Well, we we from the same city in Göttingen, and 
I think I stalked him for 15 years, and finally <laughs> he agreed to do it. So, so this is a neighbor's agreement now. Basically it is. I mean, yeah. Göttingen doesn't have much. And Symphony Orchestra and Steider, so <laughs> I choose Steider. But that's not enough of an answer. How well, did no, this book actually, come I mean, to be? Well, I think finally we met in South Africa on the art fair, and we finally decided to do it. And I mean, we met a couple of times, and Steider always said to me, at some point we do something together. And if you know him a little bit, it's a promise, you know, and you know it will happen. And then finally, we had the conclusion of all these laureates, and finally we decided to do it. How, um, you're actually, in fact, quite a modest person, I know. Um, how much did you insist on a certain strategy for the printing? How much did you say, well, this is the way it should look? I, I want the spirit of the collaboration. Oh, I handed over all my pictures and let him do, because really? it's, I mean, it's a trust, you know, I mean, there's nobody better than him. So I think, and I think we agreed on a lot of things anyway. So it was a process pretty simple, except the waiting time. <laughs> now, yeah, uh, it was exactly as he said, but uh, for me it was a little bit boring because he said, uh, okay, do the best and make whatever you want. And uh, I wanted to learn from him. I want to hear a little yeah, bit stories yeah. about Nobel He's Prize laureates and so on and so on. And um, so um, I, I catched him always again and said, you have to come over. We have to make wet proof printing. We have to make another correction. We have to increase the contrast and this and that. Yes. So I had at least a reason to have him on my side five, six times and uh, to do my normal procedure and uh, now I know a little bit more about the world of uh, Nobel laureates. Maybe we also use this occasion, we'll just do a few more minutes and then uh, let's see, we'll have a little time for questions from the audience. But uh, with Peter, you as the Nobel stalker, um, how does this happen? How do they agree? How do you uh, manage to, how many um, images are in this book? Uh, 18 years. 18 years worth, and how many? You don't remember how many? Oh, I think 410 or something. Okay. How does that happen? Um, you do asking you me? Yes. You hired me to do it. So uh, initially, <laughs> initially, but you uh, you ran with it. Yes. Uh, anyway, I mean, if the Smithsonian involved and the Deutsche Museum and the Nobel Foundation, it's not too hard to get these people. And finally, I think now we have like the fourth value partner on board is Steider. So, I mean, it really is a circle of all these institutions. And, I mean, of course, Nobel laureates also have a big ego. So, I mean, being yes. surrounded in this, with this institution, except a few of them, it's not too hard to get them. I mean, there's some, there were some problems, like Aung San Suu Kyi when she was in jail or other people. But in general, we were pretty lucky that they all agreed. And it was like some Nobel laureates helped me to get the others one, like the Claire called Mandela. and so. It was fun, actually. It was an 18 years trip around the world, which was a lot of fun. And you just get the clerk to call Mandela. I, I, I understand. <laughs> it, it must be very common. Um, <laughs> I happen to know modesty is, is really very irritating. Um, I want to know who you haven't been able to track down. Who has said no? Uh, no one. That's not true. Well, have you, have you Dylan, actually Dylan gotten Bob Dylan? Agreed. Well, he agreed, but it's still on the line to get the photo. But okay, but Bob Dylan is your only failure so far. So far, it is. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with another bond between them, and that is um, a respect, which is probably an understatement, for Gunther Grass. Um, in, I'd love to, you to say a little bit about your relationship with Grass, and then I'll I'll talk about a little bit about Peter's photo, which is in this book. But tell us a little bit about your really quite profound connection to Grass. Yeah. Um, I started to work with Günter Grass in uh, 1985, and uh, in Germany we have the Frankfurt Book Fair, and uh, uh, at well, when the when the Frankfurt Book Fair happens, uh, always the uh, literature Nobel Prize winner is announced. And um, uh, when I was first time in '86 with him at the book fair, he said, uh, "Okay, we, you will see what happens. Uh, everybody uh, in Germany 
will uh, set up a discussion if this year the winner is Günter Grass. And that happens every year. Mm -hmm. It was a standing uh, ritual. Uh, every year uh, th there was an ongoing debate uh, for him and against him. Yeah, And uh, he, he was very tired of it yeah? and uh, didn't believe it. And when he uh, received uh, the Nobel Prize, he uh, said, uh, to me later on, uh, uh, he uh, he thought it uh, somebody was doing a joke and he couldn't believe it, yeah. and um, and uh, the day he was the uh, it was announced that he is the new Nobel Prize winner. I went to him in the evening we were sitting together with his wife and she said uh, um, I'm quite happy about it but now I have a big burden uh, because uh, a lot of duties duties will come up uh, and that uh, takes me away from my desk and I love to write and uh, so I need to fight for my literature so that I have enough time and um, yeah so that was the but he made you his exclusive uh, publisher, yes? No, we we we, we bought the world rights uh, from his old publishing house in 1993, and uh, there were already many books published. But uh, you know, uh, uh, another little anecdote. Uh, so the uh, in 1999 he received the Nobel Prize. And um, you know, uh, when, when I'm working with my artists, or at those days, uh, they were arriving in the morning, and then we worked all day. And I forgot totally that we have to eat and and to get something to drink and something. And uh, nobody uh, dared uh, say anything. That, yeah, exactly. So they accepted it all, and they were dying in the evening because they had no food. <laughs> and then um, uh, three weeks. After the Nobel Prize, uh, we had already sold for uh, really millions of dollars books. That was really an explosion. He said, now you have made so much money. Uh, I have an idea for you. Uh, you buy a kitchen and you hire a chef. And then from now on, your artists have food at your publishing house. And so I did. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the gross money that made this. Uh, in the... Um the book. If you don't buy it for the printer, if you don't buy it for the artist, buy it for the afterward by me. And in it there is one um, anecdote, or at least reference to Gunther Gross, which I want to end this discussion with, because um, the one of Baj's photos I, I own, you would have thought, considering what I've done for him, he would have given me more, but I only have one. Uh, and he asked me to choose, and the choice was the Gunther Gross photo, which is brilliant and uh, in a way quite relevant to these two because in it, um, Gross is actually in the spot he wanted to be caught in. Though as a Nobel laureate in literature, he wanted the photo to be done in his sculpture studio behind his house. And we see him there, as you will in the book, we see him there surrounded by some of his sculpture. He was a very serious sculptor and at one point thought that's what he would do. But in this, wonderful photograph by a wonderful photographer, his shadow looms and almost dominates the impression of the, the, uh, of the photograph. And um, I happen to know um, why that was. I've asked Peter this and he said it was in a way that other career, the shadow of the other career that the photographer was suggesting as the visual artist. But um, after it was revealed, not very long before he died, a few years before he died, that he had actually been in, in a, a form of the Nazi youth as a young man. This is not something he had been proud of or in fact willingly had done, but nevertheless it was true. Mm. Um, and when it was published, this photograph was published often uh, after he died, and it was suggested that that shadow was the Nazi past, which wasn't the intention, but the point is really that a photograph goes into the world and it takes a, on a life of its own. But really what it was intended to show is the other, the other artist inside him. But uh, uh, you are yeah. talking about this photo, uh, so um, yes, uh, I said um, before uh, that I'm doing the books at first 
for myself because I want to learn something, but sometimes there's also another reason. And uh, here uh, with uh, Peter's uh, photo work, um, um, I have really to say this is excellent portrait photography, and the photo of Günter Grass is a masterpiece. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. For example, I agree. among <laughs> others. Okay, um, I've left about 15 minutes for um, questions, uh, but understand this, this man does not stay in New York. So I will cut them, uh, the questions off after about 10 or 15 minutes. We, he, you will stay another half an hour or so, yes? That they can mingle with you? Uh, yeah. 15 minutes maybe, it's funny. And then off he'll go. So who would like to ask a question? Yes, please. Could you uh, stand up? Okay, this question is for Gerard. Um, is there any photographer that you would like to work with that you haven't yet? I, I'm going to repeat the question. For Is there any photographer you would like to work with that you haven't yet worked with? <coughs> Good questions. Um, actually, uh, you know, um, what I like to do for the moment, and what is my favorite, is uh, to develop a uh, lifetime's work of photographers. So not just the single book, so to start uh, with the early works and then um, up to the later pictures. And, um, and uh, one photographer I always wanted to work with, uh, we had a relationship and did two books together, but uh, for more, uh, there was no time, uh, was uh, Mary Ellen Marx. And um, uh, when she was dead, uh, the, her husband offered to me to release her lifetime's work in a multi-volume set, and so one of my dreams is becoming true now. I, that was a wonderful answer to the question. The the only thing about it that disturbed me was the suggestion that Peter's life is almost over. <laughs> since you, but I guess th I guess that's another kind of project. Um, yes, please. And again, stand up. It's easier for us. Thank you. Now, there's a picture in, in your book here. You're kind enough to give out of uh, Robert Frank looking at two copies of The American. And uh, was your attempt to recreate the original book or to improve it? <coughs> so this is about Robert Frank's mm -hmm. The American looking mm -hmm. at it. Yeah. Was it your intention? to um, recreate the original book? So um, in uh, 2008 was the 50th anniversary of the American, so it was first time published in 1956 by De Pierre in, fr in, in uh, France. And uh, in 2007, I invited him to come to Germany and uh, for doing the final edition of the Americans because for years he was always complaining and he said he doesn't like the book of Del Pier and he doesn't like the book of, book of Lustrum and he doesn't like the book of Scarlo and uh, one complaint follows the other. And so I said, okay, then <laughs> now let's do the final book and uh, let's discuss how you see it. And um, so uh, we started to work, and um, uh, he, I asked him, what is your dream about the book? He said it should be quite small, and then remarkable, he said to me, I'm a simple pho photographer, so I want to have a simple book. And so we we took everything away what was designish, yeah? and uh, we just printed pure photography with a minimum of text, just uh, uh, text of Kerouac, and um, and uh, it, it it was a big understatement understatement already because uh, it is said that it is the most famous book um, in the world, and uh, the two books he is holding in his hand, the photo in our book catalog, that's him sitting uh, in the garden next to the press and he is comparing two alternatives uh, of the cover. And then he decided uh, for one which was uh, very close to the first American edition from 1972. Oh, one more question, I'm looking here. No? Okay, this is the talkative side. Yes, please. <laughs> Stand up. So um, I've read the New Yorker profile, and I know that you print for big fashion brands like Carlotta Files. Um, um, how does that process, I guess, is, is that the same as what you do with your artist books? 
Um, it is absolutely the same. You know, I'm... <coughs> I'm Repeat the question. So. Oh, yeah, okay. No, go ahead. I, I can do I it. You're prepared to answer it. So yeah, <laughs> okay. So, um, you know... Um, Karl Lagerfeld is a photographer, and uh, when working with him, it is just the same as to work with uh, Bruce Davidson, Robert Frank, Henry Lloyd Wheeler, Peter Butke, and so on. Uh, we talk about the best result uh, in uh, for the upcoming book, and um, uh, and the 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 same uh, ethics. Uh, are set up for fashion catalogs and all the stuff which is around fashion. So my work begins always with the uh, invitation cards to be printed for a show, then the dossier, the, the press, the press kit, the catalogs, the advertising campaigns uh, to prepare the banners uh, for the, uh, the billboards uh, at all airports around the world. And that's all, uh, yeah, uh, that's all very easy because uh, Lagerfeld is a photographer and we are talking about good photography and uh, therefore I like to work for him and uh, for his brands. I'm not sure if I would like to work for other fashion brands. And I have enough work for Chanel and Fendi and Lagerfeld. And now I, I would, uh, okay, one last one and then I'm going to invite Daniel to come up. I can stand up loud. Please. I have one question for Peter. I'm curious, out of the 400 so photographs in the book, who was the most interesting Nobel winner that you met? Okay, this is a question for Peter, and the question is, of those over 400 people represented in the book, who was the most interesting, the ones you met? And don't just say everyone. <laughs> well, I guess, um, for me, it was John Nash, because I spent almost like 15 years with him, you know, and he is... Do you know like who John Nash is? The guy uh, from Beautiful Mind. Beautiful Mind. So he became like my protected grandfather who he called himself. So, I mean, this was like a personal relationship, so. Okay, uh, Daniel, please come up and join us because there's a, another treat involved. So this is, uh, <coughs> Gerhard, don't leave. <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs> so, then why don't you hold your book and you've yeah. also worked with Seidel. Tell yeah, us a I little did. bit about Bonsoir. this. Bonsoir, good evening. Uh, Daniel, oh yeah, had the opportunity to work with uh, Gerhard several times. Uh, I've been working for uh, luxury brands and uh, I've worked uh, with Gerhard on books on um, Karl Lagerfeld first. And that's how we get uh, friends, well, we I did, think. We did beautiful books for uh, Dom Perignon. Absolutely. And we had wonderful uh, book launch parties with uh, 100 bottles of Dom Perignon, oh. always, <laughs> because he was so generous. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a good time. So I'm not a photographer. <laughs> I'm not a photographer, but I had uh, I had a privilege access to, uh, to Gerhardt. Uh, when I worked for one of my clients, uh, I came across... Uh, uh, well, I found an incredible uh, testimony of the past, and uh, I say, Gerhard, I'm interested of doing a book about it. Do you want to do it? And I think uh, I got, I, wait, I waited only like three years, so it was quite mm -hmm. fast. Yeah, uh, not for 25, yes. <laughs> yes. Not 25. And um, so the book is called Do It the French Way, and believe it or not, it's about uh, wine and spirits, French wine and spirits. So it's uh, about the time where drinking was uh, elegant in France in the 19th century, uh, the time of absinthe and pastis and bitter and quinquina, and uh, the time where painters were inspired by, uh, by these products, when Picasso painted uh, a bottle of Pernod in 1912, and um, this all faded away, faded away when uh, whiskey came and when vodka came. And believe it or not, this is coming back. And this, is, this book is about uh, Renaissance, because there's a young generation of elegant people around the world, and um, principally bartenders, and they take back this, uh, these old products, and they create beautiful things with it. And uh, my opportunity was to, to find uh, an old distillery that was ah. bought in 1873 by Gustave Eiffel, 16 years before he bought the Eiffel Tower, uh, which my friend Mathieu, which is over there, revived, restored. We built an incredible bar there, and bartenders from all over the world are coming there, learning to worry about the product and inventing new, um, 
uh, new cocktails. And this book is about uh, documenting this uh, beautiful distillery, this incredible cocktail. So it has plenty of beautiful photographs about uh, Eiffel arch architectures and silverware and cocktails and shakers. And also, I think it's your first, uh, not cookbook, but it's a recipe book. Is it your first one, right? No, we have uh, one, one book which is called Lunches at Steidl. Okay. And there yeah. are all the <laughs> recipes <laughs> <laughs> my, my chef has created within okay. the last yes, years. Yes. But uh, this one was missing. Now the drinks are following. This, this is a small book because plenty of bartenders have given us new cocktail recipes. So it's yeah. made also, you can have them on a bar and create if you love books and if you love drinks, you might like this book. I think the... Mm -hmm. Final thought has got to be there's a new younger generation in the world, exactly. a new elegant generation Absolutely. who are interested in cocktails <coughs> and fine books. And that's good news. So we need to end with good news. <laughs> Thank you very much.